like to talk about uh, thinking effectively about gravity. And, and this is really a bit of a um, soapbox for me. I, I think that much of what I will say, uh, people you know, in the area will know. And um, mostly I would like the talk to be about, um, it's kind of a, a strange time we live in because on the one hand, general relativity has passed incredibly uh, many accurate tests. And so it's very successful. It's among our most successful theories. On the other hand, many, many people spend, including me, spend much of, your t of our time modifying it or trying to modify it. And, uh, and, and that's to uh, fix perceived uh, failings of general relativity. And those seem like those are contradictory messages. Uh, you know, if you take the evidence that the theory is working well, why do you need to modify it? And uh, if you believe it needs modifying, then it sounds like there's a problem and we shouldn't be so complacent in it. And I think both of those points of view are some ways true, some ways false. Um, but there is a message, I think, that has come out uh, in that of all the ways people have talked about modifying gravity, here's my punchline message in a win a sentence, if you kind of tune out later on. Um, almost all the things that people, not all, but almost all the things people propose to modify gravity do so uh, at the classical level. Um, and they can be organized, the way you think about them can be organized according to whether or not they fit into our understanding of how quantum mechanics and gravity interface with one another. It's famously a problem interfacing quantum mechanics with gravity, but uh, it's not as bad as people usually think it is. And uh, we know, what, probably the one thing we know about uh, gravity and quantum mechanics is the main subject of the talk, the effective field theory description. And I'd like to use that as a lens to rank the proposals that people have made at the very end, uh, because it helps you think about uh, which proposals are are uh, are conservative and which ones are are, uh, are are taking chances. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't take chances, but in addition to taking chances, we always assess the evidence for things. And a big part of the evidence for the success of a theory in gravity is coming from these effective field theory methods. So I, 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 that's why I highlight them. So, so the way I'd like to make tell my story is to first remind you of the, uh, because it's impressive when you see it all in one place, all of the reasons why we're so happy with general relativity. It's, it's, a, it's a phenomenal uh, successes. Um, oh, sorry. And then I'd like to um, move to what are the reasons that people are not happy with it? Uh, that's the GR is dead part. And that will set up the description of effective methods uh, in the third topic. And then the last one will be where I'll try and apply the general lessons of the effective methods to the, I'll, I'll kind of list, but very superficially, some of the things that people have proposed to modify general relativity and, and give a kind of cartoon ranking based on, on, on my personal take based on these effective field theory methods. And I, and I know that there's a, back, a variety of backgrounds uh, in the audience. And so I'm going to try and, uh, and, and hit a level where I, I don't leave any details out, but I'm not gonna be showing you lots of equations. So, so if something's not clear because I've erred too far in one direction or the other in that, that's another reason to stop me. So please do. Okay, so start off with the, this is the part which is always fun. It's the, you know, just a brief reminder of what general relativity is, but also uh, why it's so incredibly successful and, and how that success has just compounded in, in recent years. So we're all pretty familiar with the story 100 years ago or, or more than 100 years ago now, uh, special relativity drops and, um, and it forces people to rethink all the fundamental uh, laws of nature because whereas Newton would have phrased them in terms of, you know, you figure out what a force is and then we, we, we work with it. Uh, special relativity immediately said that you had to really think about fields. And it said that because of this I issue of action at a distance. If you have a source uh, at, a, at a position and you move it, uh, in the field picture, in the, in, the, in the force picture, the force everybody experiences in the universe changes all at once. But in the field picture, what happens is that you modify the field near the source, and then a wave goes out into the field uh, and brings the news to the rest of the universe that the source has moved. And the people experiencing the force due to that source don't see that it's moved until the wave hits them. 
And so there's a, you're seeing things as they were in the past. So it was clear that you needed to take everything and rethink it in terms of uh, fields. And of course, in electromagnetism, that had been done because part of what led Einstein to relativity was making electromagnetism work. And it was phrased in terms of these fields. So the question was for gravity, it was clear you had to modify it, but what was the field? And, and, and what was misleading was the story. Uh, so these are supposed to be two apples falling here. I turn my pen on. Here's your, uh, here's your, your, uh, your two apples falling. Uh, whoops, maybe I turned it off. Here's your two apples falling. And, uh, and we, you know, we, we normally think of the, the, the constant force of gravity as being the force of gravity. And the principle of equivalence, the observation was that uh, because the inertial and, 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 uh, and um, gravitational masses were the same, it was really true that the, uh, you could think of this force as being a fictitious force like centrifugal force. And it was indistinguishable from uh, being in an accelerator reference frame. Now that doesn't mean that gravity doesn't exist as a force, that it's a, that it's a fictitious force. It just means that this constant force is fictitious. And what's left, if you really were in that elevator and being pulled up with some acceleration, but uh, the elevator was really, or sorry, was not being pulled up with some acceleration, and you're trying to decide if you're being accelerated or if you're being attracted to the earth, the way you could tell would be if you're being attracted to the earth, you're being attracted to the center of the earth. And so the two apples are not falling in parallel lines or being, they're slowly moving towards one another. And, and so that would be the measurement that you could do to distinguish being in a gravitational field as opposed to being in an accelerating elevator. And that points to tidal forces as being the thing that needs to be described by a field, as opposed to the macroscopic uh, constant force that we think of as the dominant force of gravity. And so Einstein's observation in 1916 was that those tidal forces are described by a field and the field that's involved is the curvature of space-time. And here's where I'm gonna tell you the, what you just need to know about general relativity for everything I'm gonna say essentially. And that's how you how you you code in the curvature of space time. For those who don't know, for those who know, just turn your head off for a second, and 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 I'll just remind you of what you know. But the way that you encode in these theories uh, in in general relativity, uh, the curvature of space time is you you endow space time with a metric, which is just a rule for measuring distances uh, as a function of separations, infinitesimal separations, and the curvature is uh, related to that distance rule, the metric by differentiating. And in particular, there's a quantity called the connection, which is obtained by, if you think of this as being a matrix here, G mu nu, it's basically the matrix differentiated then multiplied by its inverse is the connection. And if you take the derivative of the connection and squares of the connection and add them in a particular way, you get what's called the curvature. And so all I really need you to know about that is that the curvature involves two derivatives of the metric. And, and the, uh, the detailed rules of general relativity as to how curvature responds to the presence of matter uh, is coming from Einstein's action, uh, this Lagrangian here, which is written in terms of the curvature in a way that doesn't really matter apart from the fact that it involves two derivatives of the metric. There's an overall constant here, which is the uh, Newton's constant in disguise. The Planck mass is related to uh, Newton's constant in the following way involving h bar and c, and the Planck length is related in, the in a similar way. And so there's an intrinsic scale that Newton's constant gives you in a quantum system, uh, in a relativistic system. and um, it, it's appearing in the in the action that describes uh, general relativity, and and you know you may or may not be. If I know our undergraduates are in the audience, and I don't know what uh, I know that our undergraduates would not all know what an action is, but what you do with a Lagrangian is that there's just, just an algorithm is what you need to know. If you're interested in classical physics, you you integrate that Lagrangian over all space time to get the action, and then you ask what are the configurations uh, which are, it's extremal with respect to variations of the metric. And those give you Einstein's equations, the things that in detail tell you how curvature is related to the, the energy densities in the universe. If you're doing quantum things, you do a related thing. You, if you're interested in expectation values of operators involving anything such as the metric, you do a path integral over that operator, or that function of the metric weighted by e to the i action. Uh, and, and either way, uh, there's a translation between the Lagrangian I gave you and anything you want to calculate. So, I'm implicitly using that and the details of that don't really matter much more. All I'm going to really use is that the, the energy, which is related to the Lagrangian, involves two derivatives of the metric. Uh, and that's going to be important in what I say. And that's pretty much all I'm going to really use in detail. All right. So people right away knew that, that Einstein was onto something. Uh, and that's because there, there were these classic tests that we learned about. Uh, you know, the, 
it, it, it captures the, the, the piece of the precession of Mercury's orbit that had not been accounted for by the, the fact that the sun's not a sphere and that Jupiter exists. Uh, that had been a mystery and that was cleared up by this relativistic effects. That it captures that there's a clocks, uh, there's a relativistic effect in which clocks respond to gravitational fields, the gravitational redshift. There's the bending of light uh, by the sun, which was tested almost immediately by Eddington uh, during an eclipse. And famously, uh, you know, locked in that that there's something really going on here that that you believe, but those tests are just the tip of the iceberg now. Now, general relativity is tested many, many, many ways, uh, and one of them is related to light bending. In cosmology, people look at at images of galaxies, and you have galaxies like these blue ones here that are distorted, and they'll have the same spectrum. and And if they are time dependent, the two images might have the same time dependence, but displaced in time. And what's happening there is that you've got a galaxy behind some large mass, like a cluster of galaxies in this case, and that gravitational field of the cluster is lensing the, the light, bending the light, uh, and providing gra gravitational images, uh, lensed images of the background galaxies. And so that's a commonplace thing to measure in, in cosmology now. Relativistic, you know, anything that gravitates and it's relativistic has to be done uh, with general relativity, as far as we know. And there's many, many things that fit that category some of which are active galactic nuclei, which have these relativistic jets that come out of them, which are, you know, extend over enormously uh, large distances and carry enormous energies uh, compared to particle physics scales. And there's also cosmology with the, the, the once you said that geometry, uh, the response of geometry to energy is the way that gravity works locally, you're led to think about what does the geometry of space-time of the universe as a whole respond to the average density of of the of, of stuff in the universe and that has been a, the, the, the description to which you're led of the evolution of an expanding universe is extremely successful and one of the best tests of it is the microwave background this famous image here uh, which is the Planck I think this is the W map image but there it's a series there's been a series of measurements of the fluctuations uh, in the temperature of the early universe in the early universe as it as it expands it cools what were once free electrons and free nuclei combine into uh, neutral atoms. And the way that we know that that happened is that before it happened, uh, charged particles are very good at scattering light. And so the universe would have been opaque at that time. The light that was around would not move in straight lines, but after the atoms form and become neutral, the universe becomes transparent. And the light that was there then is still there, but it's been redshifted and it's there in microwaves. And, and when you measure, and so this is a measurement in all directions of the sky of the temperature of those microwaves, and you're measuring essentially the temperature of the hydrogen gas as it became neutral in that early epoch as the universe cooled. And you see that there's some areas that are hotter, some areas that are colder. It tells you an awful lot about what's happened in the early universe. And it's relying in detail on the general relativistic description of how the universe evolved and what was going on in those early times. And one way we know that there's a message here is that Stephen Hawking signed it. Uh, with his initials, SH, as you can see in the box. And that's the joke that you're required to tell about this when you show this uh, in a talk like this. But beyond that, in the solar system, there are you know, precision tests of gravity. And I'd like to kind of now start to say, how precise are these tests? Because that will be important in the story I'm going to tell. So one of the best ones was is it comes from the Cassini probe. The Cassini probe is sending us signals, radio signals all the time. Sometimes it's happening when the line between us and Saturn, where Cassini was, uh, was not anywhere near the sun. And sometimes it's when the Saturn is behind the sun or very close to behind the sun. So the, the radio waves are passing close to the sun. And by comparing the time delay of those signals, you learn a lot about the gravitational field that the sun has set up and about relativistic effects, about how light propagates through the geometry near the sun. And if you parameterize uh, the kinds of geometries you could have gotten, uh, where in, in using a set of parameters, which are called gamma and beta here, where the co convention is that gamma equals one is general relativity and beta equals one is general relativity, then the deviations from one that the measurements of these signals allow are at the 10 to the minus five kind of level, which shows you the, the kind of precision with which general relativity is being tested in the solar system now. It's, it's kind of not at the ballpark level or the percent level. It's really better than that. Uh, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a precision level now. Another example of this, just to drive home that it's not all happening in the solar system is binary pulsars. Those are neutron stars that are rotating. They have a beam which passes through us and, and when, because they're rotating, it, 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 we intercept that beam in a regular way. And it's, it's, it's like someone put a very accurate clock in the middle of a gravitational field. 
these are binary pulsars, so they're pulsars orbiting something else. And so you can learn a lot by measuring the arrival time of those signals. One of the things that was learned very early was that uh, these binary systems are radiating gravitational waves. And, and you can tell because the emission of gravitational waves drains them of energy, and that changes their uh, the, the, the semi-major axis of their orbit uh, in a way which is predictable. And you can calculate it in general relativity. And here's a plot of, uh, in one of the earliest ones, it's been watched since the 70s until, until you know, recently. And this is a plot of its uh, period as a function of time, and it's decaying. And, and what you're seeing here is a comparison between the measurements, the dots, and the predictions. But the line, the theory line is not a fit to the dots. If you know the two masses of these objects, then you get to predict as an absolute prediction what the decay should be. And that's what you're being shown is given the masses of these, the pulsar and its partner, that's what the prediction is. So the only fitting, fitting part is figuring out what the masses are. And, the, and, and, the, and that's actually also very impressive. So what these things show you is for different pulsars, as a function of the, uh, the two masses, the mass of the pulsar and the mass of its partner, various things that you can measure that are relativistic effects that you can measure because you're measuring this clock so ac accurately. So the red curve is the, the, the decrease of the period that I was just talking about. And the errors are so small here that it, all you see is a line. Uh, omega dot here is another thing. The, the, just like Mercury, these orbits, they're, they're processing. And, and this is the, that's called the periastron precession now because those are stars. And this is a measurement of that. And it's again, so accurate that there's the error doesn't show up in that width of that line. Gamma is, is the dashed line, and that's the relativistic time dilation due to the motion of the pulsar in this gravitational field. And so that's also being measured so accurately that you can't see the errors. And then this stripe here, between, this, between the purple lines, this, uh, the, in this whole region here, that's a measurement of what's called R. That's like the Cassini satellite, uh, as, 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 as light signals go near a gravitational source, they slow down more, and that's called the Shapiro delay, and that's been measured. In the, in the case of the pulsar, you've got two things to measure there because we're always looking at, set, at, at at Saturn within the plane of the orbit, but for these pulsars, we're not necessarily in the plane of the orbit. So there's an issue of what's the inclination of our line of sight to the orbit. And that defines a variable S, which has been measured to be between these two solid lines. So now if general relativity is right, and you predict all the, uh, the values of these, if you measure all the values of these things as a function of the masses, they have to uh, overlap for a particular value of the masses assuming that what you're seeing is the effects of general relativity. So a uh, reality check on all of this is that all of these measurements have to intersect at a point and that point is where the masses are. And you see that it works beautifully. This is the one, this is the, the Hulse-Taylor pulsar, which is the one I showed you before the, the, the decay of. And you see that this line here, which is a prediction of the decay of the orbit as a function of the masses, precisely intersects uh, the gamma line at that point, which is the same point it interse intersects the omega dot line. And those are within the bands of S that are loud and the bands of R that are loud. But it's not just for this one pulsar. This is for, there's, a, there's about 10-ish of these pulsars are measuring this well. Here are three of the other ones. And you see the same thing's true for all of them. But it's always true that the two masses are sitting in this sweet spot, which agrees, which shows that the general relativity predictions are consistent with one another. So the fitting aspect that where you're figuring out the masses of these two things is coming from that agreement, that you've got a redundant description, more variables than you had, uh, more more observables than you had variables to adjust. And the fact that they're consistent is, is such a compelling picture. This bottom right one is a particularly interesting one because this is a case of a pulsar orbiting another pulsar. And so you get to measure more things. And that's why there's quantities like omega SO, which I don't know what it is, but it's things that you could measure in that case that you would not have otherwise have been able to measure. So there's a whole beautiful story here, which is a, whose message is general relativity works really well. And it's working well, again, at the better than the 10% level. It's working well, uh, extremely well. The new thing on the block is gravitational waves. This is the picture of the gravitational wave signal of the first one that they published. Uh, there again, you're, there's now that gravitational waves have been measured. You get to compare what you see to the things that, uh, that what you expect to have seen as these are black holes or black holes and neutron stars that are merging. And uh, there's an enormous amount of information here now that is being used to test general relativity, but only uh, more recently. So it's a, it's a kind of a newer thing. And there are terrestrial tests. So that people measure the direct forces between known things. You know, the problem with astrophysics is you don't really know what the masses are. You kind of know how things respond to the masses. 
But here you, in the lab, you can actually take known things whose size you know and measure the forces, uh, the gravitational forces due to them. And they all constrain, uh, they all agree with general relativity and they do it to fantastic precision. The best one, it depends, how, the precision depends on if you compare this to what you would expect if you had another force besides gravity as a function of the strength of the force and the range of the force, the best, uh, sense, most sensitive test is this one here, which is uh, lunar la laser ranging. You see that there's a, the, the strength of the force here is, is being me measured relative to gravity. So gravity is already the weakest force, but if you had a force which was 10 to the nine, you know, a billionth the strength of gravity with a range that was uh, about 10 to the eighth meters, we would already have known it. And what they're doing there is they're using the fact that since you can, since people have put mirrors on the moon, having been there, you can measure the distance of the moon by bouncing lasers off of it now very accurately. And they've been doing that since 1969. And so we know that the earth and the moon are falling towards the sun the way that relativity tells you they should have been doing, even though they have very different chemical compositions. And so that's an extremely strong constraint on, on how you can modify gravity. So the message there is that gravity is, general relativity is doing really, really well. It's being tested in many, many ways that would have uh, been beyond the dreams, the wildest dreams of Einstein when they had the first three tests, which were already very good. So why are people happy? Well, of course, you know, why should you be happy? If we're theorists, our job is to find what's wrong. And so there are things that you, uh, one would like to better understand in general relativity. And so I'd like to go through what those are. These are the main, I think, the main motivations for why people um, try and modify gravity. The big one is consistency with quantum mechanics. Everything I told you so far was a classical story. Things were moving classically, but but right away uh, there's a the once you as soon as you recognize that that energy that the, your, the geometry is describing gravity, there's a fundamental problem that grav that quantum mechanics is going to introduce. So if you think about what that means for for um, for if if you if you think that the geometry of space time is describing gravity, then what you want to know is to to measure if you're right is to have observers that can measure very accurately where they are and what their time is, and you want them to be as as not as 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 light as possible so they don't gravitate much because you don't want them to be distorting the, the geometry of space time. But the uncertainty principle eventually becomes a problem. So if you imagine that you have some geometrical length like a, a radius of curvature that you want to measure, I'm calling that L sub C here. Uh, you want to measure it, so you have to have an accuracy of measurement which is smaller than it. Then the uncertainty principle says that that your momenta are then uncertain at the level of h bar divided by that scale, and that carries an energy. So c times that would be uh, an, an estimate of the energy uncertainty that is associated with that momentum uncertainty. But gravity doesn't really care about energy; it cares about energy density. And so the energy density that would be associated with this uncertainty principle argument would be h bar c over lc, which is the energy, divided by the volume, which is lc cubed. And so the, an estimate as to the minimum energy density associated with a measurement that's got the precision to c l sub c would be h bar c over l sub c to the fourth. Now, Einstein tells you how much that gravitates. And so, it'll t so you can now ask, if I had that much energy density, when does that become a problem uh, if, I, if I think that the curvature of space-time is L sub C? So Einstein would say that the curvature, which is one over LC squared, is given by Newton's constant times rho divided by C to the fourth. And so if I use that value for rho, I can see that uh, what I have to ask, if I wanna have a measurement of L sub C, which does not itself ruin the value of L sub C because it has an energy density, which is too large, I have to ask that one over LC squared is bigger than this quantity on the far right here, this, this quantity here. And if I eliminate L sub C from that, it shows you that the smallest curvatures I could hope to me measure are, are big, have to be bigger than the Planck scale, where the Planck scale is that what I showed you before was this quantity defined in terms of Newton's constant. So that says that quantum mechanics will eventually become a problem, but it's probably gonna be a problem at small distances because in, you know, in, in normal units, the Planck length is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters or something. It's much smaller than any of the distances we're probing in any measurements. You could have problems before this, but this is saying that you have to have problems by the time you get down to these distances. The way that you actually see these problems concretely uh, is not, you know, that's, that's a very nice physical argument, but it's, if you actually ask, if I just hold my nose and do what I do with quantum field theories and I do it for general relativity, what goes wrong? So, to ask that, to, to underline that, think about the graviton scattering in flat space. So what we would in that case imagine is that we have a, our metric is the flat metric, which is just a constant, plus a wave or some, some space dependent uh, wave describing a graviton, a, a gravitational wave. 
and and uh, and to normalize things, if I want this 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 wave to have the the the, the kinetic energy of a particle. I need to divide by this M Planck that was in the action, the thing that's related to Newton's constant. So if I take the Einstein action, uh, the, the, the thing involving curvature that I showed you in earlier slides, and I write it in terms of H, it's telling you how H will evolve. And it turns out to be, there's a kinetic piece which tells you that you've got a wave which moves at the speed of light. And then you've got a bunch of interactions which involve powers of this H. And each power comes with a one over M Planck in, fr in front of it because of the fact that, that you, you had to normalize it that way to get the kinetic term to look right. And so you have a bunch of things they involve all possible powers of H. The or, only thing that's important for my purposes is that they all involve exactly two derivatives. And that's because the curvature that the action was defined in terms of involved only two derivatives of metric. So now what you can do is you can just do what you do when you're doing uh, quantum field theory. And you can ask, what would be the amplitude for these gravitons to scatter from one another, for example? That would be a typical question you could ask. And so you draw a Feynman graph using these interactions. Here's one involving three fields, so it'll be a trilinear interaction. Here's one involving four fields, it'll be a quartic interaction. And the two derivatives means that there's two powers of momentum associated with the Feynman rule of the vertex here and in, in here and in here. And each vertex comes with a one over M Planck uh, in the trilinear case and a one over M Planck squared in the quartic case. If I kind of ask, what is that gonna say, what's this gonna mean for the amplitude? I have to have in both of these, these are the two graphs I could draw, which are tree graphs, involve no loops. Uh, they, they both involve a one over M Planck squared, this one because it's that interaction, and this one because it has two of these interactions. And then the rest of it is going to be dimensional analysis. Uh, the and dimensional, dimensional grounds, this is dimensionless. There will be, has to be two momenta left, and those momenta are coming from these derivatives that are acting on the fields, and they're going to be given by whatever the energy of my scattering was. So I'm expecting an answer to go uh, generically like the energy involved in my observable Q. I'm calling that generically Q. Uh, squared divided by M Planck squared. And if you do the calculation, you know, honestly, as DeWitt did in the 60s, you get this. You get Newton's constant, which is the one over M Planck squared, including the eight pi, turns out. And then you get these various Mandelstam variables. If you're if you're kind of a particle physicist, you've, you're used to the Mandelstam variables, and these are the Mandelstam variables for this process. So S is the center of mass energy, and T and U are energy dependent, but depend on these scattering angles. So there's, it's a known calculation, and these estimates of the energy dependence capture it correctly. Now the problem comes when you go, when you try and do better than that. You, you, you try and use more accurately, uh, to calculate things more accurately, which in perturbation theory would involve uh, working, including more and more interactions. And so the first kind of corrections involve loops. So here's, here's something involving four, two things scattering again, but now it's a more complicated graph with more interactions. And the same way to, the way to estimate this is the same as I did previously. Each, each, these are all trilinear interactions. So they each have a factor of one over M Planck in them. So the amplitude for this has to have a one over M Planck fourth in it. Uh, there's a loop in here and the momentum in the loop is not dictated by energy momentum conservation. So there'll be a sum over all of those in a quantum path integral. So there's an integral D4P where P is the momentum in the loop. And then I've got one, two, three, four propagators in here. And so those will go like one over P squared plus possibly external momentum squared. And I've got four of them. And then I've got each vertex has two powers of uh, two derivatives. So there's two powers of momentum. So altogether, I've got eight powers of momentum, but the symmetries of the problem say that at least two of those have to be external momenta, not loop momenta. So there's at least two factors of external momenta, and then there's the other six could be loop momenta. They might not be. They could the dot 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 here includes things that could have been q to the fourth, p to the fourth, say. But but the very least you have to have is two powers of q. And so this is what you would get. And uh, the, 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 for later purposes, the thing to notice about this is that you notice that when p goes to infinity here in this integral. We've got p to the sixth here, we've got p to the eighth here. So it goes like d4p over p squared. That's going to diverge quadratically at the upper end. So there's going to be an ultraviolet divergence. And that's the short distance problem coming to bite you in a concrete application. So the, the, those divergences are the divergences that uh, are the concrete way of that physical argument showing up in a calculation like this. And what happens in gravity is um, the more complicated the graph, the worse the divergence gets because each interaction comes with a power of one over M Planck. And so here, for instance, we've got six at one over M Planck's. And so you have to have more dimensions in the numerator on dimensional grounds, and those will typically make things diverge worse if you have the same number of external momenta. And that's in this, if I do the same estimate for this graph, I get this, and you see that this is diverging like a cutoff to the fourth power rather than just quadratically. Now, the divergence in itself isn't a problem in quantum field theory because you normally would renormalize short distance physics divergences into the parameters in your problem. And in this case, we have a parameter and that's Newton's constant. And we know that the classical amplitude that we had in the previous slide 
went like Q squared. And so the coefficient was Newton's constant. So the divergences I'm talking about here would really be interpreted as a contribution to Newton's constant where your quantum corrections are changing the value of Newton's constant compared to what you thought it was when you wrote down the, the physical Newton's constant you measure is not the same as the parameter in your Lagrangian. So this in itself is not a problem. The problem is that it's the dot, dot, dots here, the things involving not two powers of Q. The argument I gave you now, I could, I could cancel these divergences with Newton's constant because the, the lowest order contribution had two powers of Q. But the same graph, I didn't have to have all these derivatives be uh, internal except for two. I could have had four of them be external and two of them being internal. And this still diverges. This has got P to the fourth. It divided by P to the, uh, I've got a cross there. It's P to the fourth. This is a logarithmic divergence. And so there's a divergence here that goes like four powers of Q and you did not have a classical contribution which had four powers of Q. And that's the problem is that these divergences that are arising cannot be renormalized into Newton's constant. Cliff? Yeah. Um, do these divergences uh, uh, appear because the background is fixed or is, has nothing to do? And this is my first question. The second question is, is the, in, in this case, uh, could the, the gravita uh, Newton uh, constant be uh, energy dependent or, or momentum dependent, uh, scale dependent? It, well, it's, it's, for the second one, it definitely will be scale dependent in the sense that as soon as it's renormalized, uh, then, then the actual value you get will depend on where you measure it. Because that's saying that as you integrate out, if I imagined integrating out degrees of freedom at high energies and, and lowering things, physics can't change. And the way that the answer will, will, will the physical answer will stay un, unchanged is that the, the degrees of freedom that I've removed have to be compensated by changing my couplings. And, and the fact that we're getting a lambda dependence in the couplings is kind of telling you explicitly how the couplings are changing in response to changing the, the cutoff. So they would definitely will become scale dependent, not necessarily, that's not the same as momentum dependent, but they will become, they will run in the sense that uh, the same way that the fine structure constant runs. Um, the back reaction story, um, the framework of this, I'm assuming, and I'm gonna come back to this, that, that, that the semi-classical approximation is a good approximation. And that actually has built into it that, the, that there will be a change to the background, but it will not be a large change because if it was, then the control of the approximations is going to fail. But I'll, if you, I'll, I'll come back to that later on. And so if you re-ask the question, then if it's not clear uh, what, the, what, what, I, what the party line would be. So the, for the purposes here, uh, also, if there's any other questions, uh, please ju jump in. That's... So for, the, for the, the punchline here is that, is that basically the problem that people hit in the 60s, essentially, was that when you calculate uh, with general relativity, at the quantum level, it looks like you've got a problem where you, you don't know how to make predictions because it, everything depends sensitively on the short distance physics that you don't really understand. And so the question was, how do you deal with that? And the evidence for that is that uh, the divergences are coming in with a power of momentum, which are not in the classical result. So that kind of tells you how to solve the problem. Uh, you know, If we had had an action which had four derivatives in it, and which we would have had if we'd had two curvatures in it, uh, then we could have absorbed that divergence into the coefficient of that action. And so people immediately had the idea, well, why don't we just imagine doing a derivative expansion where we have all possible things that could be there involving curvature, uh, and then we'll just be able to absorb every divergence into a new parameter. But the problem there then became, now you have an infinite number of parameters that uh, you don't just have Newton's constant. You have, every time you do a measurement, you've got a new parameter in your problem, C1, C2, C3. And, and so, so is it predictive? And so I'm going to leave the thought here now, uh, but I'm going to come back to this. This is predictive in a way that is made more precise, as has been made more precise. But let me continue now with the story of, of why people are trying to change gravity. This has been a kind of a, I went into more detail here uh, than, than for the other topics, because I'm going to come back to this particular topic in a second. Forgetting about quantum mechanics, uh, other reasons to modify gravity, general relativity, are, are it doesn't get cosmology right. It gets cosmology right, but provided that the universe is full of stuff that we don't understand, like dark matter. Uh, there's many lines of evidence that there should be things that are clustering uh, in galaxies uh, five times as many uh, as much as there is in the energy density in baryons. Uh, this is just two of the examples. There, the, the, it's important that there's many lines of evidence in this kind of a thing because you. Uh, one of the things you worry about is maybe the whole picture is wrong and it's consistency of, of multiple lines of evidence that, that makes you believe that the picture is right and you're really seeing evidence for something that you didn't know about. So two of the lines of evidence are, are um, rot rotation curves of galaxies. If you 
plot this, the speed of rotation of gases in the galaxy or in stars in the galaxy uh, as a function of, of distance from the center, you know, even outside where the, all the stars are. So you start, you can actually measure the hydrogen gas out here. They orbit um, more quickly than you would have expected if you'd used Newton's laws and you, or, and you, and you, you know, figured out what the Kepler, Keplerian orbits would have been. So, so either there's more mass there or there's something wrong with the Keplerian orbits. It's also true that clusters of galaxies um, have much more matter in them than, than, are, is, than you count when you see them. And that's at many levels. There's more matter than when you, when you just count the stars. But that's already known that, that if you look at the, the clusters of galaxies in, in um, X-rays, you see hydrogen gas uh, that's, that's glowing in X-rays. And there's more atoms in the hydrogen gas between the galaxies than there are stars in the, in the, in the, stars in the galaxies. But because it's, it's glowing in X-rays, it's very hot. And so it's moving very quickly. And you could ask how much mass would I need to trap that stuff in the cluster of galaxies? And, and, and you need much more mass than you're seeing in the hydrogen gas or in the, in the, in the, in the galaxies. And these various ways of measuring the, the, the excess mass you need are consistent in how much you need. And so in this picture, the, 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 you've got a cluster of galaxies. The, the pink is the X-ray emission. The blue is actually a way of measuring where mass is from lensing of, of, of background uh, galaxies. So it's a way of measuring matter regardless of whether or not it's emitting light. And so it would be sensitive to dark matter. And, and you see in this particular example, uh, evidence both for uh, the, the, the gas and for the non-visible uh, sources of matter. And there are other lines of evidence along those lines. Dark energy is similar. There's, we know that there's at least two things we don't see, or we believe there's two things we don't see. There's something else that is, can't be dark matter and it can't be ordinary matter, which is causing the acceleration of the, the expansion of the universe to accelerate as it's supposed to decelerate. Uh, and the evidence for that also comes in a variety of, uh, of ways. On the left here, you see, I, I cut off the label in the bottom here. This is distance from us. And this is the brightness of supernovas. The supernovas are being chosen because it's believed that their brightness is, uh, their intrinsic brightness is, is uh, determinable in a way that allows you to judge their distance. And then you compare that to their redshift and uh, you can figure out how the universe is expanding. And down here, you're measuring the Hubble law, the fact that the universe, things that are, tend to be moving away from us with a speed proportional to the distance. But as you move away, far enough out, you start to see things that are deviations from Hubble's law. And so you see the acceleration of the universe. That's why the supernova are useful. There's, you can see them a long ways away. And uh, the point of this story is that the, uh, what, what you see here, these various curves are, are various choices for how the universe is accelerating. And, and what's being measured is consistent with the universe accelerating as opposed to decelerating. What that means for, for matter is on the right-hand plot here. So here, this is a plot of the, the density of, of matter, which would be dark matter mostly. Um, so this is non-relativistic matter. And this is the density, the energy density in whatever this dark energy would be that would make the universe, the universe accelerate. Uh, and the units are such that uh, one means 10 to the minus 29 grams per cubic centimeter. And that number is being chosen because that's what's been measured as being the total energy density of the universe. So it's the fraction of the, what's out there that's in this stuff. And this blue area is what you would need to account for the left-hand plot here. But these other, the green stripe is basically, you know, we measured dark matter. And so the, the, you can just ask how much dark matter should we have seen on this plot? And that's what the green slide, the, one of the evidences that I did not talk about is the baryon acoustic oscillations, but it's a way of measuring the dark matter abundance. And it gives you this green stripe. The microwave background actually, because you're seeing the light coming from the microwave background, you can measure the curvature of space uh, in between when it was emitted and when it arrived. And it's basically consistent with being flat. That's how we know how much stuff there is out there. And so uh, that tells you that you had to be living on this line essentially. And they all intersect at the sweet spot, which is where this 70% dark energy and 30%, 25% dark matter comes from. So you could get rid of the supernovas and the other two would still put you there. So the redundancy of the picture is what uh, makes you believe there's something funny going on there. So people always say then, well, it seems really a bit of a stretch. There's two things we don't know. Maybe we're inferring the existence of the stuff using general relativity. Maybe that's the wrong step. It would be more efficient if you could have no new things and just modify the rules for general relativity in such a way that it would if you didn't know about them, would fool you into thinking there was two things out there. So that's an important motivation for many modifications. There are also many conceptual puzzles that gener of general relativity that you've probably heard about. There's a black hole entropy and information loss problems. There's singularities, black holes and the early universe have singularities. What goes, how do you resolve those? The physics shouldn't be giving us singularities at some level. There's a whole bunch of issues that, uh, that are puzzling in, intrinsically puzzling about gravity, but which are not directly tied to observations. 
all of these these things lead people to think about what could be the replacing general relativity. And and, and not not a small one is fame and glory. That uh, if you figure out what's wrong with general relativity, then 100 years from now they'll be celebrating you and not Einstein. And so to address these things, there's a many proposals, as, and here's a list of some of them, which I will not get into in any great detail. Um, there's things where you take the action to be functions of the curvature that are not as simple as the one I gave. Sometimes people use things like one over R uh, and stuff like that. There's things where the graviton is massive. There's things where Lorentz invariance is broken. One of them I'll mention in, in future is called the modified modification of Newtonian dynamics. And that turns out to be actually a very successful description oh. of galaxies. Yeah. One question, Cliff. Yeah. Um, in some sense, uh, the cosmological constant is natural to general relativity. Yes. And, and explain the, the acceleration of the yes. universe. Yes. There's a sense in which that's true. Yeah. Yes. In this sense, you you don't need to modify general relativity. Yes. There's two. In, in principle. In principle. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I given. I mean, given the observations, the observations are consistent with a constant energy density, which is what uh, a cosmological constant would predict. You know, if it were true that the uh, equation of state of dark energy turned out not to be minus one, then you'd need something else. But it, but right now the measurements are completely consistent with a cosmological right. constant. That's right. Yeah. The problem with the cosmological constant is going to come. Um, I'll get to that a little bit later. Is is that you know we think if it's if it's cosmological constant, that's like the vacuum energy of space time, and we think we can calculate that. And the fact that it's so much smaller than what we calculate is what makes people uncomfortable with uh, that that interpretation. But but that but whether you worry about that depends on whether or not you think we can calculate it. And if you don't think we can calculate it, then it's not a problem. So then I would agree that then dark matter would be the only real issue. That's right. So there's a variety of things here. Uh, Mond, I'll, I'll kind of allude to a little bit later, just because it's a, it does it does actually a good job of describing one of the evidence for dark matter, but but not all of them, and that's kind of why it's useful to have more than one piece of evidence. Scalar tensor vector theories are just there might be other light things out there that are spinless or have spin one in addition to gravity. We know that, for instance, photons are out there, and so there could be other things. Uh, string theory is something which was motivated by uh, the quantum problems at short distances. And so are these other things. There's space. There's a variety of quantum gravity uh, proposals that are kind of specifically aimed at making reconciling the short distance quantum problem with uh, with with relativity or with with gravity. People mostly have heard about loop quantum gravity, but really that's one of a, a list of of a variety of things that are on the market uh, at that level. So uh, I can see that I'm I'm kind of closing in on my time here. So I'd like to go back to uh, what what do we know. And so, so it used to be thought that the quantum uh, classical problem was a really fundamental problem. And you, re you read things by Feynman and, and others in Dirac before uh, the effective field theory uh, understanding where they really talk about it as being a crisis because half your brain has to have gravity turned on and quantum mechanics turned off and half your brain has to have it the other way around. And there's no one framework in which you could do it all, which makes it very hard to understand how you quantify theoretical error, if that were really the picture. And that's important because when you test quantum field three, you know that that it's a precision science and the theoretical error is part of the story when you compare with experiments. So in this famous comparison of the muon anomalous magnetic moment in quantum electrodynamics, you know, here's the experimental number. I think it's not even the one in, this is not the most recent one, but this shows you that, that it's for a long time been very accurately measured and very accurately predicted. And in QED, these issues of, of uh, quantum electrodynamics, these issues of divergences are properly understood by absorbing them into the parameters of the problem, which in that case are the fine structure constant and electron mass, basically. And that is an important part of the uh, understanding the error. The fact that you can write this thing as a series in alpha with no unknown dependence on high energy physics is important when you say that the error in the theory is 27.1 in these last digits. And that's what you needed to say in order to say these things agreed with each other. If you had no control over the theoretical error, then it doesn't really matter what the theoretical prediction is. It's always going to be consistent with the, the measurement. And for gravity, that's an issue now because I've been trying to convince you that, uh, that the gravitational measurements are really agreeing with experiment with some precision. So here's the spin down, the, the decay of the orbit of the binary pulsar, the experiment versus the theory. And the agreement is happening at you know, the, the less than a percent level. Uh, it's an important. It's important that we really understand what this theoretical error is, and what they've done here with the theoretical error is they've assumed it's a quantum. It's a classical calculation, and they've tracked all the errors that are to do with not knowing exactly what the pulsar partners are, or in the ability to make predictions with general relativity. But they've ignored the fact 
that if quantum mechanics is unknown, if quantum mechanics, how quantum mechanics gravitates, if that's an unknown thing, that's an unknown uncontrolled error. So if things are that bad, it would really be a, a, sp a stick in the spokes of this whole picture. And here's where I want to get back to this picture that we do understand how to renormalize things. And, and, and hidden in that understanding is really a quantification of how big the errors are, the quantum errors are in gravitational systems, which is important. And it's, it's, it's because we have this understanding that we can make the comparison with observations and do so, not believing that there's something that we have no control over that is, uh, that we, that is out of control. So I want to come back to this picture where uh, if we had thought of the Einstein action, the thing involving one curvature as being a first or the second term, here's the cosmological constant that we talked about, in, in, a, in a, just a general derivative expansion, which you might expect to hold when derivatives are small, so curvatures are weak, then this problem of divergences would go away. But there was a question of how you make predictions given that these constants, there's, there's an infinite number of constants, it seems. That problem has been solved. We know how to make predictions. And it turns out it's a... It, the predictions come to you as a series in the energy of your process divided by the scales in the Lagrangian, the Planck scale, and whatever the scale is m that could be in front of these one-dimensional grounds, these curvature cubed in higher terms, which need not be the Planck scale and probably is not. So what I'm what I'm going to quote for you here, the answer for is if I, if I wrote down some random graph. So if I if I if I just let me just see if I can draw a picture here. I just take some complicated graph with lots of internal lines, gravitons, let's say, lots of external lines too. So we're scattering a whole bunch of things. And we'll imagine that we have E external lines. We have L loops in this graph. We have V vertices. And each vertex is labeled by the number of fields that meet at that vertex and the number of derivatives at that vertex, which is what I and K are. You can just go through the exercise I went through before and count where all the parameters in the Lagrangian show up. Each vertex will carry some powers of m Planck and n, little m, these parameters in the Lagrangian appear only through the vertices or through the propagators, but they appear in a known way, typically through the vertices. And everything else is dimensional analysis, basically. And so, so once I've got kept track of all the m Planck's and the m's in the, in, the, in the process, I can just ask on dimensional grounds, what, what's the rest of it? And that'll have to be the energy in the process. And that gives me an estimate as to how big the, that particular graph is in, in the amplitude that we're interested in. And this is what the answer turns out to be. And so it's instructive. So I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to go through it in just a little bit of uh, detail here. Let me get rid of this, get rid of the graph here. And so, so the, um, so this is what you find. You get, a, you, know, you get various powers of E is the number of external lines. Like I said, L is the number of loops. V is the number of vertices. And there's a product of all possible vertices you could have had in the graph. Uh, and, and this product is only over the ones with k bigger than 2, which means more than two derivatives, which if you go back to the action, that means all these ones that are not the Einstein action. So these are all the exotic higher derivative things. The things involved from the Einstein action are not suppressed uh, by these powers of q over m. But the important thing is that q is always a numerator, m is always a denominator. And so uh, a complicated graph is going to typically be suppressed by ratios of that small ratio. And it's that low energy approximation that is justifying the approximations that you that makes the whole thing predictive in the following way. So what's the biggest contribution? Well, I want to have no loops because that gets rid of this factor. I want to have none of these guys. So I want to have no vertices with two or more derivatives. So I got, want to get, that'll get rid of all these factors. And I'm just stuck with a single front here. And Q squared, if I had four external lines, that would be two to two scattering. I would have had Q squared over M Planck squared. That's what we found earlier was the leading contribution to graviton scattering. So what does it mean? L equals zero and all those Vs equals zero. L equals zero means I'm supposed to use tree graphs and V equals zero unless K equals two means I'm only supposed to take my interactions from the Einstein action because that's the thing with two derivatives. And so that says that classical general relativity is the dominant thing. That's something you probably believed anyway, but here's telling you exactly how dominant it is because it tells you what the corrections are to it. So the first correction is I'll allow this to be one or I'll allow this to be one, but that's it. So that means I either have to only use general relativity so I don't have any, anything with more than two derivatives. So these guys are not there, but I have one loop. So that's one loop general relativity. Or I, I work at tree level. So this L is zero. And I have exactly one interaction involving the fewest number of derivatives I could get away with, which is four. So I have one four curvature interaction. And I can see that my timer's out. So I'm going I'm to converge very, very quickly. And, and so those are the things that will be renormalized by the, the loops in general relativity. And so this shows you that if you're, if you're working to some fixed, so now you decide how accurate you want your answer. Say you want it to one part in 10 to the 10. 
Well, you just you 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 know you know what how big Q is, and so you ask, well, how many powers of Q over M Planck or Q over little m would I need to have that accuracy? That's the accuracy you need for your experiment. And now there's only a finite number of things that can contribute to that accuracy, and that that's why it's predictive. If I have more if I have more observables than those parameters, it's going to be as good as it was in QED. I'll be able to make predictions because I can eliminate my my parameters using observable measurements and make a prediction for the other ones. And so. The predictiveness of general relativity in this picture is as good as it would have been for, for quantum electrodynamics. So that specific boogeyman is not a problem as long as you're at low energies, and that's where we always are when we're doing the measurements. So it doesn't solve the short distance problem, but it solves the long distance part of it. You, know, you might ask, where, these, where do these interactions come from? Um, the, and, and what would be, say, the scale M? They're going to come if you have some theory, like, say, string theory of what's going on at higher energies, you integrate out the heavy stuff, and you will get uh, graviton, graviton, graviton things with virtual particles, and the mass of that thing will be the thing that appears in these denominators. And that's why the smallest one wins. Uh, if you have a sum of terms that look like this, it's the smallest mass that will win. That's why the Planck mass probably will not appear here. It could be the electron mass if you're doing cosmology, say. So it's plausible those things should be there, and, and they make sense of everything. And there's a whole beautiful story that comes with it, that if you once you understand that this is how it's working, a whole bunch of things become clear. One thing is that general relativity emerges as being a very robust prediction. If you have gravitational forces at low energies and, and, you, and it's a quantum mechanical problem, which it can be now, the consistency of quantum mechanics and relativity is so tight that it makes general relativity basically the generic thing that, that it emerges as the description of the low energy graviton. In the same way as Maxwell's equations are inevitably consequences of a low, uh, the interactions of or what has to describe the, the low energy interactions of a massless spin one particle. And that the standard model turns out to be the most general interactions of the known particle content that we've seen. There's an inevitability of the low energy limit, which is kind of consistent with this picture that we're looking at the low energies of something and that something could be complicated. But what we're seeing is a very generic thing that has to be there at low energies. So now I'm gonna really very quickly talk about the lessons learned because I know I'm out of time. <laughs> and, and, and really the lessons learned are, are very qualitatively anyway. So. so here are the things that we talked about, the problems, the consistency with quantum mechanics, that was a short distance problem. These observer, observational things were long distance problems. And then the fame and glory thing was really not a problem. And so we can organize things by how to think of them, whether they were short distance or long distance, because effective field theories are saying that the thing that's hard to modify is long distances. And the thing that's easy to modify is short distances. And so these options that I showed you, uh, these things are typically being modified to, in order to fix something at long distances. Often it's dark energy or it's dark matter that they're trying to get. These things are actually often motivated by both long and short distances. And these things are normally motivated specifically by the short uh, distance part of the problem. And the, the message of the effective field theory story is that you can do a lot of things at short distances and you'll never know at long distances. And so th the message of this section is going to be that there's not a lot of constraints on these things. It means on the one hand, it doesn't really matter much what's going on at high energies for the tests of gravity at low energies. But if you think you know what's going on at high energies, then you're in trouble because it's gonna be hard to test it because it's just nature fights you by making high energy physics, it hides high energy physics from low energy measurements. And that's not because you're stupid, it's just because that's a, a fact of nature that, that high energy physics decouples. So in, in my organization of things, I'm gonna favor these things, I'm gonna, not favor these things, and these things depends a little bit on which, how much you're relying on, on changing things at low energies. So here's just a statement about that decoupling that I've already made, that, that, that it's a two-edged sword, that the fact that high energies are not playing an important role at low energies in gravity means that you don't need to know the details to make predictions in the solar system, but it means that if you know the details at high energies, you're going to have a hard time testing them, and it's not because of the failure of your theory. Now, a criticism I have for many of the modifications at long distances uh, is that you, I, would I would say that a, a, a criterion that you, they should satisfy is that they should be obtainable as the low energy limit of something sensible. And so they should be understandable in this effective field theory language in which you can understand why the classical approximation is a dominant piece to the uh, quantum uh, corrections. And so that would tell you why cl the classical approximation would be a good approximation when analyzing them. And there are many proposals for modified gravity that had, do not do that because the quantum corrections tend to come to you as derivative corrections. And if you give up the derivative expansion, you've given up that handle you had on control of the classical approximation. Doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but it means that the burden is on those people to justify what's 
what, why they use, why it should be true that their classical analyses, which is what they typically do, is a good approximation to what they think is going on. So of those series, I, I give them these grades based on that kind of a criteria. And you see that the, 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 the best one was scalar tensor vector theories, but it, even that's not uh, uniformly green. And that's because there's this issue of, of naturalness that we, 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 was alluded to in our discussion of the cosmological constant. There are some choices for the parameters at low energies, which seem like they're very hard to get uh, from generic high energy physics. And I would say that those are also questionable. And so those are getting a yellow, whereas the ones that are natural are getting a green. And since I didn't distinguish them in the original rating, that's, the, that's why it was a mixed rating. In particular, the fact that there's many lines of evidence for long distance physics also helps because although there are proposals for uh, things like MOND that get some of the, the, the evidence right, there's no known proposal that modifies gravity that gets them all right. And you have to kind of contrast that with, it's actually very easy to get uh, models of particle physics that will describe dark matter. And so, although that doesn't mean that particle models are right, it doesn't mean that modifications of gravity can't work. It means that right now, the preponderance of evidence is that it's probably particles and it's probably not modifications of gravity, although that could change. And this kind of tells you what you'd need to do to change it. You need to have some sort of a proposal which gets all of the evidence for dark matter right, which is what particle models do because the, the particle models are using gravitational inferences. There are details that are not clear that they get right, things like cuspiness in galaxies, but it's not completely clear yet that it gets it wrong either. So there's kind of a discussion going on there, but, uh, but nothing else is as successful as that, as the particle models of dark matter, for example, I think. There's no evidence that gravity is different from other interactions. Uh, this effective field theory picture makes it just one more interaction where there's ultraviolet physics and long distance physics that uh, is being compared. And there's a story here, which I'll skip, which is uh, there are interesting things about gravity which do not appear in particle physics, which teach us something in particle physics. And so there's a flow of information away from gravity as well as to gravity in the uh, interface between uh, different fields. And I think right now, the most interesting flow is one that comes from optics and condensed matter physics. That there's, there's a phenomenon of the breakdown of perturbation theory at late times. Many problems with gravity that uh, like information loss are associated with late time physics. And there's a well-known problem with making late time predictions in areas like optics. If you, if you have a situation like refraction where everybody either refracts or reflects and nobody goes straight through, perturbation theory is a just terrible description of that. But they know how to deal with it. It's not like you can say nothing. You don't have to solve quantum electrodynamics exactly to say something. And so there's, there are tools that allow you to access the late time behavior, which in gravity we should be using because those are well understood tools that have been tested in experiments. So there's, I think, uh, something to be learned in the application of effective theories to gravity that gravity is teaching us. So here's my punchline. I, I'm arguing that gravity, uh, it's beautifully, general relativity is beautifully successful. We even interchangeably use general relativity and gravity as the same thing in, our, in, when, in, in the way we talk. And, and it's, but it's not, there's nothing that we know about gravity that says that it general relativity has to be the, the truth right to the end. It would be very natural for general relativity to be true at low energies because no matter what happens at high energies, our understanding of quantum effects and gravity through this effective field theory program show us that general relativity will want to emerge at low energies. And so, so if you have a theory like say string theory, which predicts general relativity at low energies, you might've thought people would be impressed by that, but they're not because they know that anything at high energies, if it gets the symmetries right at low energies and the particle content right is gonna get general relativity right. And so that's actually a, a good thing and a bad thing from the point of view of the robustness of our understanding at low energies and our ability to infer what's going on at high energies. So this, these kind of arguments, um, the effective field theory arguments are the only way I think that's known to systematically understand the validity of the classical approximation in general relativity. And I might be wrong about that, but I, but I think whenever somebody proposes something which does not involve effective field theories, as has recently happened in the archive, the first thing you have to ask is what is it that's justifying your approximations? And, and right so far, I think the fair statement is that no one else has stepped up with a similarly predictive process as the effective field theory program. And so there's much to be learned. I'm personally suspicious about modifications on long distances. Uh, modifications at short distances are very plausible. And yet there are problems like dark energy, if you believe that it's gotta be natural, which seem like they cry out for long distance modifications. And so there's a tension there. Much of the success in cosmology relies on things that low energy physics does not like to have, small vacuum energies, small scalar masses. And that's probably telling us something interesting. It means that the kinds of theories at high energy 
that uh, will be successful in cosmology won't be the generic ones. And exploring why that's true is probably the main clue. We'll never be able to do enough measurements in cosmology itself to distinguish all the various dark energy models. But if you combine those measurements with this criterion that things emerge reasonably from high energy physics, that's probably the winning combination. So thank you for your time. <laughs> and I'm sorry for running late. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cliff. Um... It's a very beautiful talk. Uh, I think there are questions. Are they in the chat or? Uh... I'm, I'm looking. Uh... Is there any questions? Yes, I have one. Um, Bruno, thanks. Thanks. Yes, we can, we can translate. Yeah, uh, thanks for the nice talk, Cliff. I yeah. just want to, <clears throat> to ask you about the difference between quantum electrodynamics and, quant and a possible quantum generalization of gravity. Uh, it is well known that QED is renormalizable, and this fact is closely related to the coupling constant, which is dimensionless. How can you address the difficult problem in quantum gravity because you have a coupling constant which is dimensionful, and therefore every possible expansion is ill-defined at the end? Except as a low energy expansion. So it's so, an effective field theory. Right, right. You know, so my answer will be kind of a, a, a particle physics answer because that's where I come from. And um, the uh, the way I think the way I think about it uh, is I think the way many particle physicists think about it, and that is that you know in the fifties, the, there was we had another comp coupling constant which was also dimensionful, the Fermi constant. And, and it was a puzzle there to understand how corrections were uh, made in weak interactions. And the resolution turned out to be the standard model. And, and in the standard model, the electroweak interactions are all dimensionless couplings. And the effective coupling, the Fermi constant is coming as a particular combination of the dimensionless couplings and the masses in the problem, the W boson mass in that case, uh, that is relevant at low energies if you only ask low energy questions. So the suspicion is that gravity is like that, that, that the, this Newton constant is really something which is coming to you. It's really a combination of dimensionless couplings and masses. And, and, and I don't know what the right theory is, but I do know that, um, that there, there exists at least a theory which has that character. It may or may not be the right one, but it, it, it's precise enough that we can ask questions of it. And, and I would say that's string theory. The, the string, string theory, the basic coupling is dimensionless. And Newton's constant emerges as a product of the string coupling divided by the string scale, which is the masses of the string states that, the states that get exchanged. And so it's very much like this picture of the standard model giving you the Fermi theory of the weak interactions. And so if that's the right way to think about it, uh, the, the think string theory at the very least shows you that you can have a theory of gravity, which at high energies involves only dimensionless couplings. And so therefore has a better than expected ultraviolet behavior. In that case, it's actually even better. You might have thought if it has dimensionless couplings, it would be like QED and it might just be renormalizable. But in string theory, it looks like it's just finite, which is even, even more than, than you would have expected. Uh, and so, so the, the fact that the theories like that exist already shows you that I, that could be how things work. It doesn't mean that that is how things work. Okay. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. What I always do when I'm when I'm uh, testing these, uh, when I try to do something in cosmology using ultraviolet physics, I always use string theory in practice because it's the only example that's concrete enough that you can ask a lot of these questions very specifically because they've controlled these divergence issues. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, Adrian, you wanted to ask something? Yes, I I, I try to do my best. Uh, uh, I, I have a question, but uh, in general uh, relativity, uh, don't work with the torsion in, in, in general, the people. Uh, because I, I have this uh, 
question because in quantum no in quantum mechanics the, the particles are are fermions and fermions need torsion to to mix with with uh, gravita gravitation at level of uh, yeah, classical fermion theory, uh, classical spin theory. And in this direction of classical spin theory, why uh, why not try of uh, modify quantum mechanics and, and don't modify gravitation? I, th I think it, uh, if, if the question, I think your question is you're saying, a very a very reasonable way to modify gravity would be to include torsion and fermions would give you torsion. And so that seems like that's a very natural way to modify gravity. And I think I agree with you on that, that, that I think that uh, if you take the examples of, of supersymmetry, which would include string theory, they do give you torsion. And uh, they, the gravitino combines into a covariant derivative, which has torsion due to the existence of the fermions. I think the, the reason that people don't, uh, so I think that the, the fact, I think the likelihood that it happens is, is probably very likely. I would put that amongst the things at high energies that's very, very likely to happen. And I think string theory predicts it at some level because it predicts supersymmetry at low energies and in particular supergravity, which has torsion. But I think on the other hand, when people try and solve problems like dark energy or dark matter or something at low energies, what you fight is that the torsion is, a, is, a, is, is in this organization of effective field theories, it comes in as a higher dimension operator. And so, although it could very well be there, no one knows how to test its existence. So there's no one has been found an observable which would actually be sensitive to its existence. And so because of that, um, people don't tend to talk about it uh, in concrete applications of modifications to gravity because they're normally looking to change something at low energies and torsion tends to be something which is only modifying things at, at high energies or, or by small amounts at low energies. So decoupling is what fights that. But I agree with you that it's very well motivated and it's, I would say it's probably almost certainly there, torsion. So, sorry, but uh, uh, a time ago, I read a uh, uh, text, uh, 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 a paper that uh, in, in what uh, explained that the torsion could uh, explain the dark matter and the an anomalous of the uh, uh, movement of the uh, particles in the galaxy. And, and then torsion uh, could explain, uh, um, use the torsion called uh, the, uh, explain the dark matter without dark matter, and, and then uh, what? What about? Uh, so, sorry, maybe I I can I can't understand uh, what you say, but uh, why the people don't use uh, torsion in general? So I, I don't know. Uh, what I hear you <laughs> saying is that. Disculpen si él ya respondió la pregunta. Si alguien puede decirme en español, lo agradecería. Que esa es una duda que tengo hace, hace bastante rato. I think I understood the question. If that was the yeah, I, I speak a little Spanish, but <laughs> I, I understand a little Spanish, but not much. But if you don't mind my answering in English, the uh, I think the question you're asking is you're saying that there are claims in the literature that uh, torsion actually can describe dark matter without the existence of dark matter. And so it's, it's doing something which I was saying it shouldn't do, and it's, it's making a difference at low energies. And so if that's true, uh, what's wrong with my argument? And I have to say that there, it'll depend on the details. I don't know the papers that you have in mind. I, I'm, I'm kind of generally skeptical because I, I suspect there's a, there's a large number of papers in the literature which do not worry about uh, whether or not they've controlled their uh, semi-classical expansion through these effective uh, field theory uh, lines of argument. And, and so often, people will get big effects classically, but they won't worry about whether or not they've got other effects that they're not calculating, which are as big or bigger because the classical approximations are failing. And I do not know that that's what happens in this example that you have in mind. And, and so please send me uh, the reference and maybe I can look at it. But uh, to, to, to my knowledge, I don't know of any uh, examples of torsion models which are successful in the way that that paper that you say claims to be successful. Uh, and still has control over the low energy limit. And, and I might be wrong, I don't know the whole literature, and so I'd be interested to know if there are examples where, that, that are, where torsion is making a big effect. Another question. Um, you mentioned that the known version of quantum gravity are not renormalizable, but perturbatively. 
what about the numerical realization of quantum gravity? I mean, this kind of computation using triangularizations. Have, there is a lot of success in this area or you don't work on, on it? I, I'm, I'm less familiar with it. I know there's a lot of work on it. And I, 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 know, I think a fair thing to say there is that um, you know, there should be more work on it because uh, because I think it's true that that people uh, have have been able to do to, to make progress in these other areas of quantum gravity, but I think it's also fair to say that in most of those examples, they're often motivated by uh, fundamental questions like uh, how how do you phrase quantum gravity in a way which is not background dependent or things like that, and and they're less focused on how do things look like when you're very near flat space. And so the examples that I know of, of cases where people have, have explored these other ways of quantizing gravity in a numerical way, it's often difficult for them to tell you, well, the, if, you're, if you're interested in testing my model in the solar system, this is where flat space lives or where asymptotically weakly curved space live. And, and this is how you would check that I'm right or I'm wrong. And I think it's because they're tending to focus on, on, on Planck scale problems because they're, they're, they're focusing on the, on the short distance quantum aspects of things. And I, and, I, and I know that they do make a lot of uh, headway on that, and there's been a lot of uh, good work on, on that. But from my point of view, uh, what's not satisfying about that is that uh, it, it's in the category of you know, you're doing things at short distances, but until you can tell me what your effective field theory is that I can now go out and compare it to the rest of the, the world, I can't tell whether or not you're already ruling, you're already ruled out by other things. And so I think the, the mark of the, of, uh, of the sophistication of a theory is that it can... If people understand their low energy limit well enough, they can tell you what the effective theory is that describes it. And there has to be one at some, some level. And then once they tell you that, then you don't need to know the details. You can go and test it uh, on its own grounds. And, and as far as I know, the only uh, quantum gravity theory that has passed that level of sophistication is string theory, because they will tell you what their effective theory is. It doesn't mean it can't be done in these other areas. It probably means that more pushing is needed to, to get there. And it would be very valuable for them to do it, because then we can start comparing them. We could say, well, string theory says this, and this other theory says something else, and we can actually try and compare. And it might not even be for observable things. Maybe it's for black holes and things that are conceptual, but at least it would be concrete. And I don't know that the that the, those kind of numerical calculations, if they've been applied in that direction, and that, that for me, has been a, a, an obstruction in, in engaging with them. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. I, I have a, a question. I... Uh... I fear that we we unfortunately uh, have a, a lack of uh, experimental information. Uh, yes. Gravity, yes. in some sense, is mm -hmm. uh, we are we are measuring uh, gravi uh, gravitational waves, and then in some sense we are already proving gravity in ex under extreme conditions, merging of uh, black holes. Yes. And. Uh, up to now, we haven't uh, found uh, we haven't found um, no signs of of um, quantum gravity. I would say, and the other point is that uh, the the famous uh, information paradox that recently uh, Neda Engel, Engelhardt and and co-workers have uh, it seems that they are, that they are uh, needing the solution of, of this problem without uh, uh, going to again to to uh, uh, having a, a quantum gravity theory. What do you think ab about this? I think well, there's two things there. Well, the first thing uh, was I, I agree with you that the that it's the the observations are are few, and uh, although there's a there's a wonderful new window with black holes. It's 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 actually probing the the very relativistic limit as opposed to the very quantum limit. So it's uh, these black holes are large, and so they're so v over c effects are being probed in a very important way, but the energy over m Planck effects are not being challenged. And so I think there's no reason to believe that they should be in the quantum limit for these macroscopic black holes. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing to be said because there's lots of relativistic effects that are classical that it'd be nice to test. If there are light degrees of freedom out there, they should make a difference. And, and so I think one of the, the exciting things now is trying to hone in in a ro as robust a way as possible uh, to what the 
kinds of predictions are that you could see for 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 black hole mergers, for example, if you have a some of some class of effective field theories. And I think that's the fact that that's an un, that has is not a solved problem is already interesting. <laughs> so so even if it's not quantum, it could still be interesting, you know, at the classical level. For information loss, I I, I don't really know what to say there because what's 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 interesting about it is that. The problem arises deep in the regime where you should be at the low energy limit. You don't have to be at high energies, and so it makes sense that they should be able to. Um, they should need to know what's going on at the fundamental level at the Planck scale, or at least it's plausible. I don't know that it's necessary, but for me, it's also true that uh, at the time scales that they're interested in, they're in the regime where uh, it's actually very dangerous to work in perturbation theory because. It's generic that at late times, uh, you know, if, if you have e to the i h t, no matter how small h is, there's a t for which you're in trouble. And even if you're gravitationally coupled, the times that they talk about for the page time, for example, for black holes is in that dangerous regime. It doesn't mean that that the the existence of these non-perturbative, uh, the breakdown of perturbation theory might not solve the problem. They, they, they've, they've worked very hard to make the problem as robust as they can from those kind of details, and they might be right. But it's true that if you're going to convince people that you've solved it or not solved it, understanding those issues is going to be important because if if if, if some of your arguments are coming from the statement that people have calculated free fields and in, 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 or, or simple systems in gravitational backgrounds, but neglected interactions, the rationale implicitly for that would be that you can perturb in those interactions if they're small. But if you're generically losing control of perturbation theory in the timescales of interest to you, then that's a very dangerous regime to be in. And so you want to make sure that you have that right if you're going to really claim a solution. Mm -hmm. And so I have no evidence that, 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 that they have run into those problems yet, but I, they should generically be there. And I think it's true that they should also have to worry about quantum uh, issues, but, but only in the effective field theory way when they're counting their information, because they need to count the states at some level. And, and so the quantum aspects will be there, but not in the, at the Planck scale level, it'll be at the low energy level. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, we'll stop here. Uh, thanks again, uh, Cliff, for this uh, beautiful talk, very enlightening. Uh, thanks also for the for all of you that were here on this seminar, and uh, we hope that we will. Uh, uh, be together again in the in the next seminar. Thank you yes, very much. Yes, in, in the after times. Thank you very much for the invitation okay. and for coming to the talk. Thank it's uh, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff.